Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt, as we are calling now our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We now turn to Song of Myself, passage 39. Now put this in your notes right away. We're going to see sections 39 through 41 as a small subsection where we're going to see Whitman as the poet who is divine. Now by divine here, we don't so much mean godlike, although there will be some of that. We mean more like a shaman or a holy man. In other words, Whitman is teacher. As we said from the preceding lecture of 38, now all of a sudden to the end of Song of Myself in passage 52, we're going to see Whitman developing as a pedagogue, a teacher, an instructor. Here I said shaman. And the first place that he goes is to go back to his Plato and to ask the question of Republic about the ideal or the perfect. What is the perfect person? So I would write that down as our first question, okay? What is a perfect person or the ideal American? Or we might say the new American. So when we use that term, we're going to play around with it. Now, interestingly, we're going to have Whitman playing around with some very interesting questions about what it looks like when you try and play this game. For example, he's going to use the word savage, and we're going to have to talk about what does that word mean. Now, really quickly, let's just remind ourselves that we said one of the key lines from Song of Myself is from Passage 4. Both in and out of the game, and watching and wondering at it. Again, that's that curiosity element. I witness and wait. And we're definitely going to see some of that curiosity playing out here. What would a perfect American look like? That's kind of the question that Whitman will ask. All right. Now, our assumptions are that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net. Down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, the 24 poems of inscriptions, the 19 sections of Pomenoc. Hey, we're going to reference two of those, so write them down. My assumption is that you were with us when we talked about passage 7 and his views on evil as being non-existent. And that real tragic passage of 16, where we see Whitman's assumed racism regarding native peoples. We talked about it when we met it there. We'll come back to it possibly here. There are many who will reference this passage from that perspective. I wanted to point it out to you. Finally, the assumption is you've been with us for Song of Myself from the intro lecture, huge, and all the way up through the 38th uh, comment that we just, that we just finished reminding you that passage 38, you remember this? Passage 38 ends with the word questions, and then take a look at passage 39 and start counting all the question marks. Go ahead and just look at it real quickly in your own deathbed edition of Lazy Grass. And so if Whitman's going to use the word questions at the end of 38, then all of a sudden he's going to start asking questions at the beginning of 39. So there is some meaning in his madness if you get the drift, okay? Now, it is interesting that Whitman is going to play around already, have played around with this idea of what it means to join old and new, right? Remember back in passage 11, A Song of Myself, where we'll have that joining of the trapper, the mountain man, with the Native American woman, right? Okay, and we made some comments already about that. Whitman was very influenced by Cooper's Hawkeye from The Last of the Mohicans, that 1757 novel, where you have that myth, that idea, that you can take someone who has grown up in the wilderness and can somehow be civilized and can have both worlds. All right? Now, this idea is one that in Whitman's day was being batted around with two words. So write them in your notes. Frontier and the term backwoods. Okay? Now, it's in it, it, both of them reference the West. And by Whitman's day, there was great interest in what was going on out west. We're going to see more of this in Leaves of Grass. If you'll think about it, though, frontier is the idea that we're facing east and we're looking west to front that area of the west, frontier. Okay? The other word that was often used was backwoods. Now, that's a different kind of rendering. We are going west, but we almost have our back to the west and we're facing to the east. And, of course, we're recognizing that we're trying to bring civilization from the East to the West. Okay? Now, there, as, as we turn now to read this, this set of lines, notice we're going to begin with five questions. Okay? And, obviously, as we've already said, we have met the question that 
Whitman would call the, the Indian question or the Native American question in starting from Pominock Passage 16. And I told you when we met that passage that we would come back to it again. We've come back to it several times. Let's now just read the poem. Passage 39. The friendly and flowing savage. Who is he? Is he waiting for civilization or past it and mastering it? Is he some southwestern raised outdoors? Is he Canadian? Is he from the Mississippi country? Iowa? Oregon? California? The mountains? Prairie life? Bush life? Or sailor from the sea? Wherever he goes, men and women accept and desire him. They desire he should like them, touch them, speak to them, stay with them. Behavior lawless as snowflakes, words simple as grass, uncombed head, laughter and naivete. Slow stepping feet, common features, common modes and emanations. They descend in new forms from the tips of his fingers. They are wafted with the odor of his body or breath. They fly out of the glance of his eyes. Now, it's, it's an interesting image that he's going to play with. And again, we'll start with this question that he begins with, the friendly and flowing savage, who is he? Now, again, the, notice the use of the word friendly. So right away, this will be significant, and we can write this one down in 3A. In other words, for Whitman, the ideal relationship of a rugged democracy, as he sometimes called it, is built far more on something like friendship than it is built on legislation and laws. Okay. Notice the word flowing. Later it will be the word emanations is a very Darwinian term, right? That is to say evolution. Then we get the word savage. And it isn't altogether clear who Whitman is talking about when he uses this term savage. Of course, there will be some speculation that he's simply talking about natives, peoples, who have already were living in areas out in the frontier, out in the forests, and were known then to be people far different from those quote-unquote civilized. But a closer reading of this passage seems to suggest that what Whitman is saying is that the ideal American will be somehow eclectic brought together, some of the mountains and the frontier, some of civilization. Notice his, his uh, question, who is he? Which, by the way, of our big five is the ontological question. Is he waiting for civilization or past it and mastering it? In other words, what is the relationship of the ideal American to civilization? What civilization? Well, we said this in earlier lectures about Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, as he called for the poet of America, that we as Americans had stood in the shadow of Europeans long enough. And this idea that Europe represents civilization and something strange is going on out here in America. Whitman very much wanted to say, it's not strange, it's just new, it's different, and it's viable. Why? Well, because it's friendly. Look at the next lines. He, is he from, notice the anaphoria, by the way, of the is he, is he, is he three times, right? Is he from, is he some southwesterner raised out of doors? This idea, of course, that natives people somehow lived closer to the land than civilized people. Is he Canadian? By the way, notice in the 55 version, he will spell Canadian with a C. And then notice here, we're back to that spelling that we talked about earlier in Leaves of Grass with the K. Typically, that's how he would spell it. Is he from the Mississippi country? By the way, do notice that every one of these is a masculine pronoun, he, right? Miss Mississippi country? And then he references several potential locations. Iowa, Oregon, California. Notice how we're moving further and further. Iowa, and then even further west, Oregon, and, then he, uh, and California. Is he from the mountains? Prairie life? Bush life? Or... Sailor from the sea, well, obviously think about Melville's Moby Dick at that point, right? And then there's a break. And then he says, wherever he goes, this new, flowing, friendly and flowing savage, men and women accept and desire him. That is to say, there's a certain understanding of inclusivity. Everybody within a democracy accepts everybody within a democracy, especially this ideal person. They desire, he should notice four of these, like, him, like them, touch them, speak to them, stay with them. In other words, in a perfect democracy, we accept everyone, and everyone accepts everyone. 
Well, again, speaking in almost like shamanistic language, the poet says, this is what a perfect democracy and a perfect America would look like. What kind of behavior? Lawless. Go back to starting from Pominock Passage 7. Do you remember that one when he was messing around with talking about there is no evil, right? So here it is. Lawless as, it's an interesting simile, snowflakes. In other words, freedom. We would maybe say it that way. Go wherever he wants. Words, and then it's an interesting simile, simple as grass. And of course, leaves of grass is the title of our collection of poems. To what degree is grass simple? Go back to Passage 6 where he talks about that one. Uncombed head. I told you, hair matters in Milton's Paradise Lost, and hair matters in Leaves of Grass. Notice now he's going to say, why would the ideal American ever worry about combing his or her hair? Wear it the way you want. In other words, a certain kind of freedom to do whatever one wants. You'll remember that he said in passage 20 about wearing his hat. He'd wear it any way he wanted. Now the ideal American will wear his hair or her hair any way he wanted. And then the word laughter, which is significant, because of course Whitman loved the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of Laughter, happiness, Scooby snacks. In other words, for Whitman, an American is, right from the beginning, friendly and always laughing. Whitman, by the way, was a great laugher and he loved to be around people who laughed. The next word is an interesting word, naivete. Now, of course, technically the word can come off as foolish, right? We would probably recognize the Whitman's idea of accepting. In other words, believing in each other right? and wanting to believe in each other. Now, the next phrase is a fascinating one for Whitman, because here is the poet who's always talking about, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, says, slow stepping feet. In other words, cautious. We might say it that way. And then, interestingly, with his democratic language, common features, common modes, and emanations. Now, this word emanations will take us back, of course, to flowing savage. In other words, we might call it evolving, right? Developing. They, notice we've gone from he to they. They descend, which is interesting that we've played the word, you know, uh, descend and, uh, and playing around with the idea of Darwinian evolution, right? Just think of it. I mean, dis uh, Origin of Species, 1859, four years after this is published in 55. And then it's even there in the title for Darwin, Descent of Man, 1871. They descend in new forms. We can't read the word forms, obviously, without thinking of our Plato and Republic, right? From the tips of his fingers, it's almost like magic, right? It's almost like a cosmogenic story or myth. It's almost like a new kind of creation. And then again, they, they are wafted with the odor of his body or breath. Now you'll remember in passage 24, the scent of these armpits are finer than prayer. And now we're back to this idea of the odor of the body or breath. And then his flight motif. They fly out of the glance of his eyes. Now the word glance we're going to hear in passage 48. To glance with an eye or show a bead in its pod confounds the learning of all time, he'll say. And of course he finishes then with the eyes. So notice what he's saying. He's saying that the ideal American, the ideal democracy, is a collection of individuals who are free to live the way they wish. And of course we're all doing it together. At 2A then as we have said, Whitman wants a rugged democracy, an evolving democracy, a dynamic democracy. It's often asked, what would Whitman think of the America of today? And I think the answer is, he would think of the America of today what he thought of the America of 1855. Everything he says in this poem, it has to be even better, but it has to be accepted that it's quite a remarkable phenomenon. At 2B, we'll just point out this anaphoria. Notice he plays that game two different times, right? At 3A, we're going to now mention someone we've not mentioned in these lectures very much, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Now, you'll remember that Rousseau in 1755 had written his Discourse on the Origins of Inequality. Discor now, now, Rousseau himself, Marsh, uh, uh, sometimes maligned for this, he never actually used the term the noble savage. Now, the word savage and its a juxtaposition with the word noble, a myth of an ideal, as we were talking about it with Hawkeye, for example, from Last of the Mohicans, was an idea that possibly Whitman was playing around with. It's hard to know for sure. I'll let you decide how you read that one. 
Remember, Rousseau did say, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains, right? Well, also think about Thoreau and Walden. You can write that one down in 3A, as well as Emerson's classic Nature, right? As there's this sense that something profound is happening in America as this movement West is happening. Of course, we also know that something tragic and devastating is also happening, not only with the native peoples, but also, of course, with native animals like the buffalo, the bison. And we commented on that when we did, starting from Pominock Passage 16. Finally, for you, as you try and own this passage of 3D, what for you is the ideal person? What for you would the ideal American look like? And what would it take to make that kind of ideal person? Do you think it's even possible? Right? Or is that something that we should try to avoid at all costs? Where do you come down on that one? Let's move now to passage 40 and the continuation of Whitman's shamanistic or, or pedagogic or teacher voice as he continues to develop the, these ideas moving towards the end now of Song of Myself. Thank you.